All right, all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Connecticut Suns Leadership Chalk Talk. Um, I'm Tarika Foster Brasby, and I am the Sun sideline reporter, so I am thrilled um, to be here with you all as host and moderator of today's panel. Um, I know it's going to be so much insightful information being shared today throughout our conversation. Um, we've got some of the best of the business when it comes to organizational leadership. So um, today I know you're going to hear some meaningful conversations. We will be talking about various areas, including team building, conflict resolution, building equity in professional sports and corporate boardrooms, um, providing access and all those things that really go into a solid game plan for ensuring diversity, equity and inclusion. So um, we will have our panel share some nuggets with you all for anyone who um, so especially our young talented minds out there that are looking to break into this industry or any position of organizational leadership where DEI is and should be valued. Um, we also would love an opportunity for you all to ask questions. Please use the Q&A um, function or write your questions in the chat and we will um, absolutely do our best to make sure that um, we will do our best to make sure that we get those questions in. Um, but I'm not the expert on this panel. These uh, three amazing people are. And so first I'd like to welcome a uh, recent inductee into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame and Connecticut Sun team president, um, Ms. Jennifer Rosati. Hey, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thanks um, for joining us. Yes, um, our next panelist is a champion at every level four-time national champion, WNBA champion, gold medalist, girlfriend got everything going on, okay? And now she is the Connecticut Sun Assistant General Manager and Director of Franchise Development. So hello, Ms. Morgan Tuck. Hey everyone, thanks for jumping on. And finally, we have a special guest with us today who has led Connecticut's largest health plan since November 2020. So please welcome President and General Manager of Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Connecticut, Mr. Lou Gianquinto. Hi, Lou. Thanks, Tarika. Appreciate it. Great to be here. Absolutely. Thanks, you guys. So I'm just going to jump right into it. And Jen, I'm going to start with you first because I I think when I think of diversity, equity, and inclusion, there is no better place that I think encompasses that than sports, right? And there is no person that truly has to manage all of those things when it comes to different backgrounds, different upbringings, different, you know, faiths, different everything like coaching. <laughs> you have to deal with different coaching styles and you have to deal with people who play differently and make all those things work together. Um, just what are some of your experiences in drawing a parallel from coaching to what it is that you have to do now in that sector with the sun? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny when I first started, I, I wasn't sure what would translate. Um, and the longer I do the job, the more I realize that, you know, leadership is leadership, right? And coaching, mm -hmm. you know, for 20 plus years, uh, I've encountered so much um, of the things that I, I think and do day to day. And um, I mean, I started coaching when I was 25, so I didn't know <laughs> that I was thinking about DE and I back then. Um, but when you're recruiting, you want a diverse team, right? You want, it, you know, you want somebody who can bring the ball up the floor. You want somebody who can shoot it. You want somebody who can rebound and defend. Um, and then you want diversity of thought in your locker room and diversity and leadership and experience. And so I don't know that I was intentional about it when I was 25, but, um, I learned to understand the role that I have and the importance of diversity. Um, so when I transferred, you know, to the Connecticut sun and, you know, at the time it was, people were coming out of COVID. We didn't have, I think, maybe four people on staff. Um, now we have a staff of over 25. Um, you know, I really set out to think about, you know, what I wanted my staff to look like, what I wanted it to feel like. And I, I knew that I wanted a great culture and I knew that started with making sure I had every kind of different person that I could have in uh, surrounding me, um, talent wise, uh, age, experience, uh, gender, um, race, I, I felt like it was really important like to build this important. team around me um, to understand that, hey, this is important and I'm going to be intentional about it. And and then to send the message that it, we need to be intentional about it as a basketball organization. And so a lot of the work that Morgan does in the community is 
development and community impact. And we want to spread the word that this is important to us, that the platform that our players have is going to be amplified by us. And we want to get fans when they're young and teach them um, and find partners like Anthem and find partners that understand the values that we have in terms of inclusion um, and every, but everything that we do across the board. Yeah, you know, you touched on quite a few things in that statement, and I want to get to all of them, and I hope that we have time. Because the first thing that I think of is when you mentioned, you know, having a staff of different races and different genders and different, like, I don't think people always often understand the true nature of diversity. It's not just, you know, the on the surface differences, but also the diversity in thought and the diversity in experiences. And, you know, Morgan, I want to toss to you a little bit here because because playing on um, a team, right, you get that, right? Like the WNBA um, is majority a, a league of black women, and yet it is still one of the most diverse leagues in professional sports because there are so many different people who bring so many different energies. Because of that, I'd love for you to kind of share, you know, what are the, some of those characteristics that you found, you know, within your teammates that you prioritize specifically in the realm of diversity and maybe how those characteristics that you found with your team have translated over to, you know, what you're doing as a front office executive. Yeah, I would say, honestly, the first characteristics I think of is, you know, someone that has confidence. Um, and I think that's built over time. And I bring up confidence just because something I saw is, you know, with the diversity and having a lot of different types of people on the team, the benefit of that is the, you know, the broadness of perspectives that you have. You know, people come from different backgrounds. They have different situations, different life experiences. And so when people have that confidence to share that and to use that in the way that they lead or the way that, um, you know, they play on a team or how they interact with teammates. That's something that it really improved my perspective. I think from even when I was younger, right, there's people that grew up in the same places as me, had pretty similar experiences. And you go off to college and now you're around a, a bigger group of people that have had different experiences. And then you go pro and then you go overseas and it's like your mind is blown on the different perspectives that you have. But I think having that diversity and I think the WNBA is great with that, like you said, it's a lot of black women, but there's people that have played all over the world that have been on many different types of teams, different type of coaching styles, different leadership styles. So I think having those things and being able to kind of voice that and share those opinions is something that, you know, whether you're on the court is really important. And even now in the office, I think is even more important. And like Jen was saying, the diversity of thought is huge. You know, having people at a meeting that can maybe think of something that, you know, you wouldn't even think of at all. You know, those things are really important. And I think having that confidence to share it is pretty key. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Jen, I don't know if you wanted to, con to, to, to follow up with that, but I just think that that really plays into a bigger thing, which is culture, right? The culture of your company, the culture of your team, like where people feel that they are empowered to give their diverse thoughts, where they feel that they can share their different ideas. And Lou, I know with you running a company um, with so many different people um, on various different levels, it's important to build um, a culture that truly embraces diversity and embraces inclusiveness for, for, for various people. You know, share with us a few keys that maybe you have with creating a culture that embraces diversity and inclusion. And Jen, I would love for you to comment on this as well with what you're doing with the sun. 100%. Yeah, you know, for me, and I, you know, you ask anybody on my team from day one getting here, a culture drives success of, of our health plan. It, it really, it truly does. I'm a firm believer in that. I've seen it throughout my career in various companies. A strong culture will outpace anything, any other company that you're competing with. Um, so, and diversity and equity is a huge part of that. Diverse teams just perform better. And it's because of many of the things that were mentioned already, um, different points of view, uh, you know, how people uh, take their perspective on certain things. And for us, it's really, really important because we represent a very diverse membership. So, you know, you have to meet that with a very diverse team. Uh, so, like, you know, a lot of our a lot of our time is spent intentionally talking about diversity, equity and inclusion. And you have to have a culture that um, supports that, that allows for openness of thought and discussion. Uh, and that has some programmatic um, parts about what we do, everything from, you know, training, um, uh, teaching people how to recognize unconscious bias, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when they're dealing with members, there's a lot of uh, concentration on when you're dealing with a member, there are many, many things that we are trying to make sure we, we understand. It could be as basic as how we speak to our members and access of care issues that stem from, uh, from issues with diversity and equity, um, care delivery and experience, and, and our ability to, to, to impact social needs. And all that, all that um, is better served when you have a strong culture that puts an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for us, it's it's cornerstone to what we do and the membership we represent. Yeah, and I will just say that you know it's it's something that you have to live, right? It's not just about um, who you hire, right? You, you, uh, Tarika, you mentioned empowering. You know, I think. If you you can hire a diverse staff, but if you don't allow them to have autonomy to make decisions or have uh, the courage to speak up in a meeting or feel that they have a stake in the success of your organization, then you're not being inclusive, right? So you're you're doing a good job and you're hiring, but you're not intentional in being inclusive. And so, you know, I think that we we try and make sure we live by that. You know, we understand who we represent. We understand that there's 11 black women on our team that we are, you know, uh, marketing and we are trying to fill our arena for. And we also understand that they have diversity and what they believe in and what's important to them. Um, and so we want to make sure we're showing up in different ways. And I learn something every day for my staff <laughs> and I, I try to encourage them every day to you know, have the courage to speak up and offer a suggestion or offer an improvement. Um, and I think our staff does a good job of, of 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 doing that down the line. I know Morgan and Annette, who's on this call, you know, they they you know empower us to show up in the community in a lot of ways, and not just because it's the right thing to do, and um, but because you know, as a staff, we want we want to be proud of what we stand for. Um, and so, you know, we we show up and volunteer. We had, you know, we 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 did some volunteering with Anthem and Lou and his group last summer at at um, the Fresh Market in New London. Um, and, and so, I just think it's important that you live what you say. Um, that you're not just um, speaking that hey, we're going to be diverse in our organization, but that you actually live it and you showcase it. And, and Jen, just to double down on that, it, it and it also comes down to the partners you choose, right? And then. Yeah. And how you're working with them, and how you get your team involved in, in that as well. Like we have, uh, you know, we we pick a lot of partners across the state of Connecticut, and we look for those that have the same values as we do. And um, and then we don't just have a partnership, but we get engaged. And and that and that I think is is critical. And when you have a strong culture that's diverse and also engaged in the community, it it kind of enhances uh, the the importance of it. Yeah, you know, I think that most of us um, have some um, examples of times where we didn't quite feel that we were included in certain things um, or times where we didn't feel like there were um, equitable choices for us in certain things because, I mean, the equitability of being diverse and being inclusive makes a lot of sense. I know just recently, um, and I'm sure there are those who are watching who, you know, may have encountered this or not, but what really sparked this in my head, Lou, was that you mentioned unconscious biases. And that that is a real thing. People truly don't realize that some of the things that they may do or say, you know, can make a teammate or can make a, a another colleague um, feel um, a certain type of way about you know now how they will now approach certain things within their within their company because of something that someone may have done or said and didn't even realize that they have done or said something that may have come across as offensive but i want to give a perfect example of something that recently happened to me um i went to the doctor's office and we were talking about a treatment plan for something that i had going on and the 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 nurse kept saying things like you know, but with your plan, you may need to consider this because it's cheaper or this because it costs less or this. And I kept thinking the whole time, I am no longer listening to what she's actually saying. All I keep thinking is, why does she assume I can't afford this? Or like, why is there this thing that I, I'm looking for the cheapest plan? Like, where did we get here? And I know that she wasn't doing it intentionally, but there was, I feel like there was an unconscious bias there that someone like me may not have been able to afford the care that I was asking for. And 
I, I want to see how that translates into what you all do, where how do you have to or, or better, better question and Morgan, I'll go to you with this. As someone that has played on various different teams most recently, have there been examples where you have maybe experienced or felt that there were some unconscious biases or some inequities towards you? And how did that make you feel at that time? Um, I would say really the, the first time I can think where I experienced anything like that was when I was in like fifth grade, fourth grade, there wasn't um, a girls basketball rec league. It was only a boys league. And so first they told us that me and my sister that we couldn't play. And my dad was like, nope, we're just going to play against the boys. Right. And it was four girls on our team. We ended up winning championships. So it was great. But it was a lot of pushback because we were the only girls in the league. But I will say, as I've gone through my career, I've been really fortunate. You know, I think from when I was in middle school, high school, college, and pro, I think all my teams, all my teammates were really inclusive. And I think to me, sometimes that's the power of sports and what it can bring, you know, where maybe in regular life outside of sports, I might've stood out or maybe have those biases, but sports has been really inclusive to me. But I think when I look at, you know, a, a big one, I think that we've all heard of the 2021 NCAA Final Four, when it was the weight room situation. So I think for me, it's more of looking at from, kind of from the outside into some of these situations where you see female athletes that are just not getting the same, right, or not getting something that's equal just because that they're female athletes or the response, a lot of different posts and things get on social media where it's people that don't even watch the sport, don't watch the game, but discrediting it because it's women. So for me, I think it's it's been more from the outside looking in, fortunately, but it definitely happens. And I think a lot of that is that unconscious bias where maybe someone sees something that's a female athlete and they're automatically thinking, oh, well, it must not be as good just because they're women. Yeah, Lou and Jen, I'd love to hear how, you know, maybe you're able to kind of combat these things when you see them or when you hear them or, you know, to try to even get maybe your teammates to to kind of check their unconscious biases. Yeah, and, and, and it's a lot of it is situational, right? You, you have to recognize it in the moment and you have to have kind of a teaching moment around those things. And 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 um, and, and then there's specific like programs and training. I know that we do at Anthem uh, to drive uh, home and and actually show examples of, hey, this situation and, and ask questions around what how did how did you interpret this particular scenario? And then, you know, that 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 training program helps instill in our folks you know, how to recognize unconscious bias and then what to do about it, you know. And, and the other thing we do at Anthem is um, we have something called business resource groups. So we have, uh, and they represent many different dimensions of diversity um, and, and they help strengthen our culture of inclusion. And, and some of those things include beer, include Asians committed to excellence, advancing disability inclusion, African-American professional exchange, Hispanics for inclusive workspace, women, uh, women inspired networking. Like we have various groups that are set up that concentrate particularly on those different cultures and then bring back to the organization learnings and things that we can incorporate into our training and our programs. So if it starts, it has to be programmatic in a, in a corporate environment. It really does have to be programmatic because there's so many people that we have to, you know, we have to train and, and educate on this stuff. And, and if you don't do it that way in a corporate environment, it's hard, it's hard to, to make progress. Mm. Yeah, and I would, I would just add that, you know, you, you, would, you might assume that in a WNBA front office, like we don't, you know, necessarily need as much training or we shouldn't have to worry about that because of, we're choosing to work for, you know, an organization that is representing a league um, that has 80% black women. But I think that that's where I know I would be making a mistake if it wasn't something that was being addressed, if it wasn't something that I was intentional about. Um, you know, even the Mohegan Sun has been much more intentional about it as a corporation. And I think like like Lou is saying, as a bigger, you know, branch of having more thousands of employees, it, it has to be something that's being talked about. And, and what we learned in our last training was it has to be something that you're training all the time. It can't yeah. be once a year. It can't be a one-time program. It can't be um, a one-time comment. Um, it has to be, again, it has to be something that you're living and breathing. So it inspired me to think more about ways that we could um, train in DE&I in our office and make sure that I'm I'm responsible to, to 
creating that kind of training and, and bringing that kind of training to my staff and not just assuming that because we work with black athletes that we don't have unconscious bias because, you know, as the woman that spoke to us a month ago said, it's not just about race. It's, you know, it can be about gender. It can be about age. It can be just making assumptions that something is better than another thing. Um, it had, you know, it, it it's, it's everywhere you see, you know, she used this example of you like regular M&Ms or peanut M&Ms. Well, that's a bias right so understanding what a bias is and understanding that you're not always doing it intentionally but sometimes that intentional by unintentional bias is something that can be uh, really hurtful and create an environment that somebody in your office might not be comfortable working in so just making sure it's something that we recognize as a smaller office but we don't underestimate the need for continued training and, and you also have to me measure it too in, in, mm -hmm. in some way there's a lot of different metrics you can do and I know at Anthem we have a, a tremendous amount of uh, tools available to us. Things like, you know, um, how do we measure pay equity? Um, you know, how do we measure? We have we have a very clear analysis around our demographic makeup of our employees and our leadership teams separately to understand who's in leadership, who's not. Um, mm -hmm. Feedback: We have surveys uh, that we do every every single year on our uh, associates, and we we um, analyze those feedback. Result, feedback results from the surveys, which include questions around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, all those things. You have to have some way to try and measure, especially in your when you're dealing with a large corporation, um, to measure how effective you're being with, with some of the programs and training that you have. Yeah, that's really interesting that you mentioned that too, in terms of like measuring the success of your DEI training and programs, because I would imagine that not everybody, no matter how hard you work at or no matter how hard you try, I do not think there's going to be a time where 100% of the time you're going to get the feedback that you're doing it right, right? right. So what do you do in those instances or how do you prioritize you know ensuring that these members feel involved and engaged knowing that there may be some who have come from a, a different place where the culture is different and they still kind of carry some of that hurt some of that triggering from you know maybe a previous employer or a previous experience i'd be very interested in hearing um from you jen as well as you morgan um and actually from all of you i'd really be interested in hearing from the whole panel um yeah. on you know what the, how do you handle those challenges and those conflicts from employees or colleagues who you know still carry some hurt from previous organizations over to you um that make you know again i, I guess this kind of ties into like this conflict resolution where you know there there are things that they've brought with them from the past how do you change that how do you fix it so that it's different in where you are um i would say yeah. Something that I had heard um, um, from someone that I kind of reached out to when I started, and from from my standpoint, it's definitely more outward. You know, obviously being out in the community and community relations. Mm -hmm. um, and what I was told is we can't necessarily always fix the problem, right? Like we can try to give tidbits to kind of plant the seed. And so that's just how I view it. Where you know, I think when you look at community, it's there's all unfortunately there's always an issue, right? Or there's always something that can be solved. There's always something that someone needs. And we can do a hundred things and then there's still a hundred more things that need to be done. So I think the way that I approach it is you listen to people and you try to have empathy, right? You just try to understand where they're coming from. Um, but then at the same time, we do what we can to just plant seeds to hopefully inspire other people to plant more seeds. And so I think that way, I don't know if the problems will ever be a hundred percent fixed, but at least it's a way that you can kind of make a bigger impact by, insp by inspiring others to make that impact as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I'll just add, you know, j just from all my years of coaching, you know, the one thing that I always tried to provide was a safe environment, you know, and sometimes that's a little harder in a, you know, office space or a corporation um, versus a locker room. Um, but, you know, you, you know, ev everything you look at when it, when, it, when you talk about DEI training, it's creating an environment where pe people people feel comfortable telling you how they feel. So understanding each other's differences, understanding each other's backgrounds and creating a space where someone feels safe to be able to say that comment is, you know, it triggers me or that is a microaggression or that is an unconscious bias. And if you don't create a space and you don't create relationships in your locker room or in your office setting, that's this kind of stuff that festers. And so 
I always tried to really be intentional about making sure that the things that our our teams were doing in the past were uh, were, were based on getting to know each other and getting to respect each other and feeling comfortable being able to tell each other how they feel. And so then when it comes down to conflict resolution, when something does come up, um, you can create that locker room space or that office space that allows that person to tell the rest of the office how they feel um, and allows the rest of the office or the team to respect that opinion. Um, because as Morgan said, sometimes it's not, it's not intentional. It can, it's just that you're learning from another person and you're learning to now go forward and be a little bit more conscious about how you act and how you include, um, or how the things that you say, um, affect others. Um, and that can be as, as, as simple as making a comment about somebody's basketball skill to, you know, as, as hard as making a comment that feels racist, you know, so, um, I think as a leader, it's just it's important that you don't shy away from those conversations. Um, it's important that you, you know, handle them with maturity. You allow the the people involved to be, you know, talking to each other and hopefully building a respect for each other um, that will, you know, allow you to be more productive and efficient as a as a unit as you move forward. And And whether it's an office team or a basketball team, in my mind, you know, it's people. And so if yeah. you treat people right and you make people feel like they can operate in a safe space, you're going to have an environment that is a lot more productive. Yeah, just uh, totally. Uh, and everybody hit this, but the open communication and that starts with culture. You got to have a culture where, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it encourages open communication and, and encourage participation from all. So if you notice, you know, there are particular people that aren't, you know, participating in in discussion you know maybe it's something you need to address a little bit more deeply and talk to them and I, I think it's uh it's also about uh you, being inquisitive about other cultures and not shying to jen's point not shying away from it and mm -hmm. you know things like celebrating uh, all the holidays and celebrating different cultures and getting to know a little bit more um about those cultures you know and 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 encouraging them to talk about it to to allow um to allow for the team to better understand some differences that they may not even be aware of. Yeah, that's a very, very strong point. You know, I, I, I use the example of Juneteenth all the time. You know, I'm almost 40 years old and I literally had never heard of Juneteenth until I was maybe like 25. So it would be ridiculous of me to be upset or assume that if I, as an African-American woman, had not heard of this holiday or was truly familiar with what this was for almost 25 years, that someone who it isn't a part of their everyday life and their everyday culture to just know that this is what we should be celebrating or this is what we should be doing. So it's a learning experience for all of us, but you hit the nail on the head when it comes to how we get to that part. And that's effective communication. Like we have to be able to communicate effectively to either say, yes, you know, this is the, the way to address something. This is the appropriate time to address something. This is how I approach someone to address something. Or, you know, maybe we need to figure out how we can align our, our office or our team to all share the same or the same common goal. And so, you know, I would love to hear um, Jan, I'll start with you. I'd love to hear any, you know, recommendations or suggestions or things that you have have used in the past that has worked um, in terms of effective communication in your office. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I, you know, the older I get, you know, the more, you know, I try to read about, you know, the more I tried to read about leadership. Um, and it's, it was uncanny how how much I felt like I had learned playing basketball in college <laughs> um, without even knowing I was learning it. Um, and, I, and I know that Morgan and I's experiences were, were different, but we had the same leader. Yeah. And, I'm you know, sorry. there's probably <laughs> there's probably not a whole lot of other than the fact that he's a little softer now and dances in the huddles. Um, there's probably not a whole lot of difference between what we were being taught, you know, between the decade or I don't even want to date myself <laughs> or two that Morgan and I played for Gino. Um, but I can remember when I was a freshman and I was the starting point guard. So, you know, you're a point guard and you're, you know, just thrust into this leadership role because you're supposed to tell everybody what to do and where to be and when to do it and um, celebrate them and yell at them all at the same time. And it's pretty overwhelming when you're young. 
And I remember Gino saying to me, like, if you want your teammates to listen to you, you have to get to know them outside of basketball. And that was like lesson number one in leadership, right? It was, and it can't be fake, right? It has to be a genuine, you, you have to care. Like if you want people to run through a wall for you and, you know, like help you succeed as a leader, then you have to care about them as a human being. So it's not always easy to do that, you know, everywhere you go um, for every single person that works for you. But I think that if you want to effectively communicate with people, they have to know you care, right? Like one, right? They have to know that you care about them as a human first. Um, I always like to say over communication is key. So if I tell somebody something, I usually like to follow it up in writing. Um, I think that that's important if you want, you know, to be effective because not everybody's a great listener, but everybody can read. Um, and again, I think it's important that you listen. I think part of being an effective communicator is being an effective listener. Um, and I think it's, you have to understand that as a leader, that if it's always you being the one talking, um, you're never going to get all the information that you need to lead somebody well. So being an effective communicator is just as much about being a great listener as it is about, you know, how you talk to somebody. Yeah. yeah and I, I would, I would just add that, um, you know, it, it, leadership transparency. I mean, so it starts with the leader, right? If, if you have a leader that's open and transparent, um, and uh, it, it builds credibility, right? So, so I, I think one of the, and this, it, this, is, it sounds like not related, but if you're a leader and you admit that you make a mistake on something, you immediately build credibility. And if you can build relationships um, as well, and, and and it was interesting when I took this role over in you know November of twenty, what were we all going through? It was a shutdown yeah. pandemic, mm -hmm. so I took over as a leader virtually. Um, so it was tough because you know, for me, I'm an office person and, you know, you, you can build a better personal relationship, you know, outside of a meeting when you're just walking around the office and talking to people. And so I'm, like right now we've just reopened our office and we're, you know, we've got people in the office and, uh, you know, one of the best parts of my day is just walking around talking to people <laughs> and, and that, you know, there's a relationship building that happens there, um, but but it starts with the leader. And and if you see a leader that's open, transparent, willing to talk and chit chat without it being a formal meeting, and uh, you have that openness of communication, you get to know about each other outside of work. Those things will open up a lot of those gaps that that, that you know close a lot of those gaps that you have, and people um, being able to bring some of that stuff forward. Morgan, I know that there are some, um, and I want to say this, you are one of the few people I know who have successfully transitioned from player to executive. And I stress successfully because there have been a lot of athletes who have tried to find, find what they want to do outside of whatever sport they play and have thought maybe that's in the front office and it hasn't always worked out in the best for them. But for you, it it truly has, it, it appears that it truly has been working out for you. And I know that it's not an easy transition to go from one you know sector to the other, but I like to think that there have been so many things that you've been able to take with you from your, your days of playing um, to bringing that now to your front office experience. If you can just share some of the things that you've learned as a player and how that helps you now, um, especially in the realm of the realm of DEI. And you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but if there's just some keys or some things that you can share about what that has done for you and how it has helped you, I'm sure the audience would appreciate it. Yeah, I'll start by saying it's been, I would say successful, but it's been a process. <laughs> and I would say what has helped, I think the most is the, my team that I'm surrounded by and my leaders that I have. I don't think I would be as successful or been able to make this transition without them. You know, that comes all the way from the top with Jen down to the bottom to every person in the office. Um, and I always have to get Annette who's on the call a shout out. She's been instrumental in helping me with that as well. But I really have a solid, solid team around me that's helped quite a bit. Um, but some of the things that Jen mentioned, I think the biggest thing that I've learned that really translated is the work ethic. You know, when I first started, I was kind of confused on what is working hard in an office look like, right? I knew basketball is getting in the gym, watching film, putting in the time. So I just took that as I got to put in time and I have to ask questions and reach out to people and try to figure out what I need to do, how to do it and how to be successful. 
Um, and then I think the other thing, especially in the DEI, is working with other people and working with different types of people in different situations, whether it's really nice and easy, like when you're winning a bunch of games and things are going good, or when you're in a little bit, a little bit of a slump, right, and things aren't going so, um, so well. And I think that's something that really translates. You know, we have our off season, in season, there's times that are really high stress where people might be a little bit more stressed out, you know, a little overtired, because one thing that's different, I thought you worked really hard as a player and you do, but the time that you're at work <laughs> is a lot less <laughs> than when you're in the office, you know, so you spend so much time with your coworkers, you know, where they kind of become your family and that's who you spend the most amount of time with. And so I think learning how to, you know, build those relationships like we spoke about. Um, and I think it's really been good just to, you know, you grow those friendships, you know, and you understand people and try to learn them. And then I think that helps when you're working in groups or when you have to collaborate on something. But I think the collaboration has been amazing. And I think I, I wouldn't be as good of a collaborator without my basketball career. But, you know, I think overall the transition has been good because, you know, we know, we learn how to work hard. You learn how to figure things out and how to keep pushing forward, even when, you might be feeling overwhelmed or stressed. You just keep moving forward. Um, and I think the last thing that really translated was being open to asking questions. I think mm -hmm. that's been the biggest thing. You know, for me, I'm big on if I don't know something, I'll ask. Or at first, I'll try to figure it out and then I'll ask, you know. But I think having that confidence to be able to do that um, and just being willing to figure things out has made the transition um, a lot easier for me. Yeah, she's she's being modest because she's also <laughs> really smart. <laughs> And she's curious, you know, and she, she's like a sponge, like she wants information and because it's new, you know, to her, because she went right from playing into front office, you know, she has a, a, a lot to learn, but she is so willing to take it all in. And she's so smart that she knows how to process it. And she's great with people and honest to God, like if you're willing to be open and ask questions and you're good with people, they want to help you. And I feel like, you know, Morgan's transition has, I, I don't know a lot of other people who've done it, but if, you know, from my vantage point, it's been extremely successful. So you're, you're de definitely right on the mark there, Tarika. Yes, I'm here clapping for you, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a couple of questions that I see in the chat. And so I do want to make sure that I get an opportunity to ask some of the questions that our, our listeners have. And the first one is, you know, from Jamie and wants to know what has been the biggest challenge when coming to an organization going through a culture or mentality change and overcoming resistance. I know for you, Lou, that would have been taking over in the middle of a pandemic and really for you the same, Jen, you know, taking mm -hmm. over in the middle of a pandemic as well, um, going through consistently going through changes even now you know the way that the structure and the team of the Connecticut Sun looks very different this year than it did in year, the last couple of years so you know what are those challenges and what is that like whoever wants to start Lou you can start and we'll close with Jen. okay great yeah so yeah no, it, it's it's it the pandemic uh, starting in the middle of pandemic it was it was uh, it was tough as a leader to come in and, and have to you know and, and and first thing on my checklist always is culture how do I how do I build the right culture um, and then there was a lot of I mean there was just admittedly a lot of transition and a lot of transformation of the of the team there was um, there was a lot of retirements happening I think once COVID hit that we had a lot of well tenured folks in in Anthem in Connecticut and a lot of folks decided okay that's it they're going to retire so we had a lot of leadership um, changing. We had a tremendous amount of turnover happening. Um, there was a lot going on within our plan at that point in time, and uh, and so there was there was also a shift transformationally in in the staff at, at the same time, and, and it was um, it was challenging because you're not in an office and you ha you have to have so I, you know, you you just have and you have to be a little bit more uh, deliberate when you're virtual versus you know like I said walking around and just chatting to people. And so I started doing a lot of these um, coffees series where I would, I would, you know, once a week or sometimes at early phase twice a week, would just grab an hour with three to five associates, uh, regardless of level, and just have a have a discussion and just you know, no agenda, just just talk. And so it would you know, that was incredibly successful early on because it allowed me to get to know people for people to get to know me to understand kind of you know the the values I have and, and the culture I want to build it also allowed me to get a lot of great feedback on how the team was doing where we were strong where we weren't 
from a culture perspective. And it helped me to kind of design, a, you know, a, a path for us on the culture front. Um, and we actually went, at, you know, from, you know, when I came in, I think we were about our, our, a, our scores, our, our, our associate engagement scores, uh, you know, kind of at a high level index was around 60%. And we just had our best year there ever. We're at eighty-seven percent, and 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 positive feedback on the um, on, on the survey. And that was with the first year and a half in in, in re really a virtual environment. And so it, it you have to be a little bit more deliberate in your approach when you're dealing more virtually. And and going forward, you know this is this is how it's going to be in, in the corporate world, especially. It's going to be a lot more work from home. It's going to be a lot more virtual. There's a lot more flexibility. It's not. It's not you know, the days of everybody being in the office together are not there. So you have to adjust, mm -hmm. and you have to adjust quickly, or else you you could lose um, you know part of that culture. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that you know, just starting from my most recent transition into this this role, um, I it, you know we we were you know severely understaffed. A lot of people had left. Um, you know, so we were, you know, myself and Amy Shear, who's a former vice president of, of business ops, we were able to kind of build a culture the way that we wanted to. And I part of why I took the job is because I was, you know, very impressed with the culture of Mohegan Sun, Connecticut. Um, and it was preached to me on my interview, you know, when I came up to interview for the job and I met with casino leadership and corporate leadership and then even tribal leadership you could tell their messaging was the same and it wasn't scripted, you know, that they were a family, that they had a culture that they believed in, in, in terms of, you know, customer satisfaction, but also team member satisfaction, right? And that mm -hmm. they felt that they were going to make hires. They weren't always going to be right, but the people who didn't fit their culture weren't going to make it. And then the people who did were going to enjoy working there. And so I thought a lot about that when building a team, you know, we had a lot of positions open and, you know, Amy and I, I, we set about hiring people that we knew would be cultural fit, even if they weren't exactly maybe qualified for a specific position, we felt that we can teach you the skill set, but we can't teach you how to be a great teammate. Um, and so, you know, we've had our ups and downs and we've had our hits and misses, but we definitely as an organization feel exceptional about how our culture has developed. And I think, it, you know, from what Lou said, it's about being accessible as a leader. It's about taking suggestions. It's about letting people have their voices be heard and empowering to make decisions. Um, but it's living and breathing that culture every day and, and, not, and not necessarily giving in, right, to a difficult situation or a difficult um, employee. And then, you know, Paul and I talked about this other day. He said, you know, we got to make sure we continue to celebrate um, and put our energy into the things that are working and to the people who are working and that are exceptional in our organization. Because sometimes as a coach and a leader, you start to focus and spend all this time and energy on the bad apples, right? And all this time and energy on the people that are resisting culture. And we need to make sure as leaders in the Connecticut Sun office that we are pouring in to the people who are living and breathing our culture every day so that they're the ones that become leaders of the future. Yeah, that's a very fair point. I mean, people love to feel valued and appreciated. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. is important to ensure that you're showing love essentially to people who are doing it right and not just focusing on those things that aren't going as a uh, as as we all planned there is and you you mentioned you mentioned something that i said that was tremendous that i, that I firmly believe is sometimes overlooked it, it's it's less when you're hiring and you're recruiting people it's people people often will look too much at the resume and the skill set yeah. and do they have the subject matter expertise and not enough at the person yeah and so i would much rather you made this point i would much rather i have, i have in the past hired a hired somebody because of their approach, their attitude, um, their eagerness um, over someone that had maybe some more subject matter expertise, but didn't have some of those intangibles. And at all, that, is, that is something that I think is lost a little bit, you know, in, in, in the age of just looking at kind of resumes and picking people. I, it doesn't necessarily subject matter expertise. Yes, it's important for certain things, but more important is the person. Yeah. Would agree 100%. Um, so we have one more question in the chat. I think we might have two, um, but this one comes from Lindsay, and I'm going to toss this one to Morgan. 
Um, Lasia Claridon was a member of the Sun. I'm super proud of what they have gone through and how well they have represented their identity out in the world at large. Most of his public handling things were outside of Connecticut, but I would suspect that she had had to work through things with the team and the organization while in Connecticut. So from a DEI and Sun standpoint, is there anything you can comment on or share or how would that go if it happened again? And I'm tossing to you because you would have been her teammate, I believe at that time. So what was that like in terms of embracing um, embracing Lasia? Yeah, I would say when Lasia was on the team, I think she was toward the beginning of her um, journey and her kind of um, journey in her identity. Um, at the time, you know, she still, she didn't identify as non-binary non at the time, um, but I think, and this isn't just Connecticut Sun specific, I think the WNBA is very inclusive, you know, I think it's a league, like you kind of mentioned in the beginning, in the intro, you know, it's a league where people feel like they can be themselves, and they can, you know, be successful, and don't have to, you know, hide who they are, or feel like they can't express that, um, and I think for Lasia, first, she's a great person, but I think she's, really felt the support from a lot of the other players in the league, no matter the team um, and from the league in general. So I think she um, Lage is one that definitely, I, th I don't think it was hard to, to be inclusive. You know, I, again, it's just part of that culture of the league and being a part of the yep. league. And I think when you're on teams or working with people that might identify differently than you do, or maybe people in your circle or in your community might identify differently. I think the biggest thing and something that Lasia has mentioned is just, accepting people for who they are, right? You don't have to agree. You might not have to understand it. Um, but I think something that helped me, and this is this was after Lasia was on the team, um, but we had a training with our staff. Um, it was kind of like gender one-on-one. And it was really just breaking down from the basics of the different ways people can identify and different um, gender identities and sexualities, things like that. And for me, it was very eye-opening. Um, and there's some things I still don't really understand or might not have like a total, be able to wrap my mind around completely, but I think of just learning and trying to make sure that, you know, even if you don't understand something, you still accept that person for who they are. Yeah, super important. I know one thing that I have loved that we have started doing at some places that I've been is that we just simply ask, right? Ask someone for, you know, what pronouns do you prefer? You know, mm -hmm. ask someone how they would prefer to be identified. I've never met anyone who has, been upset by asking, how can I respectfully address you than just by assuming? Um, so I would imagine like those kinds of things really help and work towards providing a very inclusive DEI culture. Um, I see a hand raised by someone, Mr. Paul Pendergast, I believe. Um, I think he wants to ask a question. Paul, are you ready? I saw him on there before. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. He was texting me on the side, so I'll make sure I get it. Oh, there he is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we, we, you're on mute, Paul. Let's see. Can, if I can unmute, but I can't unmute him. Can you can you unmute, Paul? Oh. Oh. <laughs> hey, Paul Rector, can you unmute him? I cannot. Not on my end. No, I'm trying. I'm looking for it, but allow Mike there. Do we see it now? Try that. No. All right. We will figure out how to get Paul in here, and in the meantime, I will ask this additional question from Sarah as we try to figure out how to get Paul's question in. So Sarah says, you are all inspiring, but what are your favorite resources on developing DEI in your organization? Books, podcasts, are there some resources that you all go to to help with your development? Um, I can start with that. And I don't have necessarily one specific thing, but one thing that's been really helpful for me in the community space is reaching out to people that are doing the work already. You know, I think, working for the Connecticut Sun, we can't focus on just one initiative or one program or one topic, but a lot of our community organizations that we worked with, even ones that we don't work with, but we can reach out and just ask questions and maybe get an idea of what they're working on, I think has been really helpful with kind of expanding my mind around DEI in general. Yeah, Jen? Yeah, I mean, I would say for me, my journey over the last like four or five years has been about self-education. 
Um, you know, I think it's really important that I'm not asking other people to educate me, but that I'm looking to educate myself. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know that I have a podcast I listen to. I'm actually putting together some DEI uh, workshop for our team next month. And so I've been Google, I just Google like DEI activities for workplace or for team bonding um, to find the kind of activities that will allow people to feel like they're safe. They have a little bit of fun. They're revealing something about themselves, um, you know, but they also, you know, are, are sharing something that's really important to them. Um, you know, so I, I think it's just, you know, for me continuing to find those resources, if people have some good ones that they want to put in the chat for me to continue my education, I'm happy to take your recommendation. Um, but I, I think, I think for a lot of us, it's, you know, do the work yourself, right. And then make sure that I, I continue to find opportunities for training for my staff. Luke? I, I, you know, it's nice. I have the luxury of, you know, our parent company, Elevance, um, has tremendous and dynamic, you know, resources and tools and training and, um, you know, events and discussions constantly going around around this topic. And, um, you know, so I, I'm available to grab resources really, really easily here. And so that's very helpful. And we have a, an incredible HR team that mm -hmm. um, is, is on the forefront. And this is on the forefront of all of our discussions. So it, it, I have just a treasure trove of of resources here, which is which is wonderful. So Paul is going to bring on the guest Paul so that he can ask his question verbally. <laughs> oh, that's how we got it. Okay. That was my best attempt. Okay. So, so, so Paul, now, P, Paul, now you should be take, able to get, come on and you unmute can. yourself. Paul Pendergast. Stop texting me and come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, maybe right. he's not. Still not, still not able to get it. All right, so we've got a few more, more minutes left. And so before I let you all go, um, I definitely wanna hear from each of you if there is some advice that you would have for someone that's looking to, you know, get more into the DEI space or for some maybe leader out there that is trying to build that kind of inclusivity in their own offices. What are some suggestions or recommendations or advice that you can give to them um, so that they can be better um, in the DEI space in their own industries? I'll start with you, Lou. I think, you know, it's, it's don't shy away from the topic and that's number one. I mean, in, you know, inquire um, and for, get first, like we all said, find the resources you can find. But I think there's also just power in talking to your diverse team and, and understanding the different um, perspectives and cultures and and things like that. Um, I really think that's a huge part of it. And then and this is an advice, whether it's DE&I or um, career progression or whatever it may be, relationships are everything, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's internal or external. And so um, if you are successful at creating relationships that are diverse um, and, and having a network of people that, you know, from a work perspective, non-work perspective, and you're collaborative and, you know, uh, and you work with people and you build credibility with them in the good times, um, you know, when things are going well and then, uh, you know, your career, when things aren't going well, you have reliable, a uh, re reliable network. And it's the same thing for DEI. and I. I think it's when you're thinking about building a network of people, you should be thinking about DEI and I when you're doing that and, and make sure you have the right relationships. Great point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll just say, I know this is a little bit cliche, but people say like you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And as a leader, like you, you can't, you can't shy away from hard conversations, as Lou said. Um, and you, and the more you talk about something that you're not comfortable with, the more you become comfortable with it. You know, and I think again, when I started this journey, you know, it was I was down in D.C. at G coaching at GW, so it's like the capital of the United States, and there's protests going on right off of our campus after George Floyd was murdered, and it was maybe not a space I was as comfortable talking about. And, and I had been coaching for 15 years, you know, a lot of black women. And so I talked about it and I read about it and I educated myself and I made sure that I became more comfortable and, you know, understood that the importance of the role that I had in these women's lives and in the future of women's basketball. And so 
part of taking this job at the Connecticut Sun is like coming f- full circle with a league that didn't talk about this when I played 25 years ago. We didn't talk about social justice issues. Nobody asked us about these things. We didn't have social media to talk about things that were important to us. We were just basketball players. And now these women are more than basketball players. And it's my like obligation to amplify <laughs> who they are and what they stand for, right? And so you can't do that as a leader if you're not comfortable in your own skin. And I don't have to know everything, you know, I, I can make mistakes. And I think, you know, you 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 want your your you know, people that you work with to trust you that if you make a mistake, it's not intentional. Um, and then just being honest and being real. Um, I think it's just really important. You you can't be a leader that's not that that's not vulnerable. You, you can't be a leader that isn't willing to show that you're human um, and show your vulnerabilities. And I think you have to um, let your team know that like, hey, I'm I'm in this with you, right? Like I'm going to make my mistakes. I want you to call me on them. I want you to help me be better. Um, but I'm going to be intentional in how I build this, this organization, how I build this team that we are, how we show up for each other, how we show up for our basketball players and our coaches, and how we show up for the community and, and the partners that we align ourselves with. And I couldn't be more proud of the team that I have and our ability to be able to do that in, in a few short years. And really the only thing I'll add, um, because Lou and Jen really covered it, is just to come into the DI space with an open mind. You know, I think of trying as best as possible to kind of take out any stereotypes or previous thoughts that you have about a certain group or a certain demographic um, and to really have an open mind um, because there's a lot to learn and it's ever evolving. Like DEI, this focus on it is relatively new. And so I think there's more and more to learn um, over time. That's why consistent training is important but to really have an open mind and to being open to people sharing different experiences or different thoughts that might conflict with something that maybe you believe or something that you experience. Um, And that I think last thing is just, if you haven't experienced something that doesn't mean that someone else hasn't and that their experience is not valid. So just to keep that in mind when um, dealing with this space. Well, everyone, um, I want to thank all of you for making some time to join this panel. Um, especially all of our guests who registered to come. I hope that you all learned something and gained some valuable information from our panelists. Lou, thank you so much, Jen and Morgan. And, you you know, I will close with one of my favorite um, quotes from Audre Lorde, the writer. Um, It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. So again, I hope that you all have a wonderful evening and thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Tarika. You're the best. Thank you, Tarika. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. it. Bye, guys.